Hola, voy a hacer un ejercicio a partir del día de hoy que consiste en coleccionar algunas de las conversaciones más interesantes que he tenido la oportunidad de sostener en mi paso por la X y también pues por este fascinante mundo de la radio a manera de podcast y lo voy a poner el Bilingual Podcast. Because it's a podcast where you can speak English and hear it in English. Yo lo puedo oír en español, pero la idea es que tenga las dos habilidades al mismo tiempo para que pueda entender un poco el proceso. Lo primero que quiero contar de lo que ha pasado esta semana en la X y de lo que me ha pasado a mí en general es un interesante podcast en el que participé a mitad de la semana con un hombre llamado Andrea Leonelli. Él tiene un sitio web que se llama Digital Music Trends y me pegó una llamada en estos días para hablar con un dueño de un sello discográfico de Europa llamado Jules Parker y con una figura muy importante de la música y del entretenimiento en términos de investigación en los Estados Unidos que se llama Steve Knopper sobre diferentes asuntos. El tema era la caída de Twitter Music, que me imagino que a muchos de ustedes que llegan a este podcast a través de redes sociales eh, habrán eh, entendido y habrán conocido durante la semana, pues Twitter Music no funcionó y eso como que lo van a acabar. Entonces me llamó Leonelli para que habláramos con Nopper, quien les cuento está trabajando en una biografía de Michael Jackson y antes hizo una tremenda, tremenda investigación sobre la caída de, de la industria de la música y publicó después en un libro llamado Appetite for Self Destruction. Muy recomendado el libro, indiscutiblemente. Entonces, con Nopper y con Jules estuvimos hablando junto a Andrea Leonelli de la caída de Twitter Music. Hablamos también de la participación de Telefónica y de la llegada de Telefónica al mundo del streaming con Rhapsody y con Napster. Di mi opinión muy abierta, muy sincera sobre el tema, sobre lo que yo creo que va a pasar con el tema del streaming aquí en Colombia a partir de la llegada de, de Rhapsody y de Napster a competirle a Deezer y al modelo este de música que tiene el operador Tigo en Colombia. Vamos a ver qué sucede con ese tema, entonces creo que si quiere darse una vuelta y conocer un poco sobre las opiniones profesionales que se dieron en ese podcast, lo invito a que lo busque en YouTube, está como DMT 155 DMT 155 ese es el lugar el eh, blog de Andrea Leonelli se llama Digital Music Trends y lo puede encontrar también en Twitter como arroba Trends y ahora sí entonces ya después de haber hablado un poco de lo que ha pasado esta semana en términos personales quiero poner a disposición de la audiencia on demand una entrevista que tuve hace un año con el ex manager de los Rolling Stones y el papá de uno de mis grandes amigos que se llama Max Oldham, Andrew Lou Goldham, quien vive aquí en Bogotá y tiene una casa en Apulo con su señora Esther Farfán y es un hombre que no da muchas entrevistas. Hace poco le dio una entrevista a la revista Esquire de aquí de Colombia y la revista Esquire estuve como seis meses detrás del tipo. La entrevista que nosotros publicamos en la X originalmente duraba 15 minutos, la hicimos de 15 minutos, con diferentes momentos así como de producción sonora y todo ese tipo de cosas, pero en realidad la entrevista duró mucho más de esos 15 minutos, duró como una hora y 15 minutos. Entonces la idea detrás de este podcast es que yo pueda contarle cada semana sin ningún tipo de edición cómo fue esa entrevista cómo sucedieron las cosas. Y se llama Bilingual porque en muchas ocasiones la entrevista va a ser toda en inglés y mi presentación va a ser en español. Or maybe one day I'll just speak English and the interview will be in Spanish. You know what I'm trying to say? Como para callar un poquito a los haters allá afuera que dicen que Marín por qué habla en inglés y en español al tiempo y que por qué Marín habla Spanglish y la vaina. Pues básicamente es porque es un tema cultural, porque me crié en una nación que habla inglés, pero también soy de Manizales y hablo español y me encantan los dos idiomas. So I don't care, man. You know, I'll speak any language I want. You know? It's basically it. It's the reason why I'll do the bilingual podcast from now on. And I'm going to start it off with this amazing character who tells me a bunch of stories that I know you're going to enjoy if you speak english then you're going to definitely enjoy this interview this conversation with the incredible mind 
That's Andrew Lou Goldham. So this is episode one of the Bilingual Podcast with Mr. Andrew Lou Goldham. So I was talking to Max yesterday on through Facebook, uh-huh. and he told me you guys were at Bruce Springsteen's yeah. show. I'll talk about that when we start. Right. Yeah, okay. I, th- I think we're, we're ready to we're go. ready? Let's go. Yeah, Good. sure. Okay. What was that like? What was... Bruce Springsteen like? Well, uh, Bruce Springsteen is the reason that I have uh, a bitch of a la gripa, la gripa colombiano. Oh, yeah? <laughs> la clima que es lógico que tú es en Vancouver o Londres, pero aquí es en bruto. Es no lógico. Esto es lo tropicos. Por favor, señor. No? Y, uh, but Bruce is la comenzá de este, ay, muy amable, gracias, de este capítulo de la gripa. Um, y uh, uh, dos semanas atrás yo soy nuevo yo con uh, nuestro hijo Maximilian ¿no? y uh, me voy de nuevo York a Filadelfia por Bruce ok la última vez yo miré a Bruce en un concierto los cuatro años atrás con la familia va en Atlanta ¿no? But Bruce en esta época tiene Clarence Clemens ¿no? Claro, el saxofonista. So, it was the E Street Band de los últimos 15 años y todo esto. Esto es un nuevo cara de Bruce y también en Filadelfia, uh, 52 veces he sells out. No, so Philadelphia belongs to Bruce. Right. No? So, básicamente, okay, so 16-piece orchestra. Uh, the relationship between Bruce Springsteen and and the American people is something the president should have. It's fucking amazing. You know, like, he has faith in them and they have faith in him that another performer could not dare have. Why is that? What is it about Bruce Springsteen? Well, because uh, he always writes and speaks for them and to them. He didn't suddenly, after three or four gold records, go and live in a penthouse and live in a private airplane and lose touch with La Tierra Firma, no? He's, he's a, a grounded person. Um, he knows exactly who he is. Not only does he know who what his audience is, he cares what his audience is. He just doesn't come in and fucking rape them, you know? Like right. it happens so often. It's not like Madonna turning up, give me your money, give me your money, right? I need, I need to go shopping for Christmas, you know? Um, and uh, so the relationship is very, very special. And seeing him with Max was, it was a religious experience. I mean, he lets the audience transport his body for like five minutes over the crowd. They are carrying him. Mel Gibson would die. <laughs> he would, you know, Mel Gibson would want to film it, you know, because it has all of those elements. I mean, man, if they dropped him, he's still 62 years old, you know? <laughs> you know, the La Nueva Sección de Horns, no? Con, uh, que es nephew? Yeah, que... yeah, sobrino. Sobrino. Uh, Increíble, was good? Increíble, man. Increíble, no? Um, he, It's hard to fill Clarence Clemens' shoes, isn't it? They did. They did? Yeah. Oh. And he does something where they, without words, which is magnificent, they're playing a song, y toda la gente conozco que Bruce canta y pensa por Clarence Clemens. And un minuto, he va con la mano like that. Y por cinco minutos, dieciocho mil gente is thing. Never mind Mel Gibson, Hitler would like that. <laughs> no? Because the fucking power. But it's, it's, it's the power is, 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 he doesn't abuse the power. No? Um, how do you control that? I mean, how, how do you deal with him, that? Man. He does. He does. How come... Um, Does anybody else in show business still do that? I mean, like, hold power over people in, and stay grounded? See, I have never seen U2. By people I know who follow U2, 
geographically around the world, they seem to have that power um, over... I find it hard to believe, you know, <laughs> okay? Um, uh, he's still a potato farmer. Um, you know, I mean, but, but Bruce is... Interestingly, Bruce Springsteen plays to double the people. Cuando vaya a, um, a Madrid, it will be ochenta mil gente, no? Mm -hmm. Y en, en Roma, es setenta mil gente. So, hay elementos de rock fascismo. <laughs> Allá, que sube la, 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 la mesa, but it's, it's, it's un elemento. Um, but uh, the relationship, man, I mean, his new record, he does uh, ocho or diez canciones from a nuevo disco, no? Because they're now, they're about the um, problems of the working people in America. No? Uh, the audience is... Um, is uh, is amazing because they're so out of shape. Right, and he's strong as an he's oak. strong, man. I mean, the people next to us have got walking sticks. I know. Bastions, <laughs> no? A, one woman in front of us, caga in los pantalones. <laughs> See? Porque no, no, no tiene la control. <laughs> si, continente, and I said, Max, ¿qué es esto? <laughs> and it's the fucking mujer en frente. Y... He, 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 uh, he, he says, no, Andrew, no, puppies, no. I said, look, she's going like this. She's trying to push it back in. <laughs> so he is um, fucking amazing, right? Anyway, so when you have that type of experience, and I have probably had that wave come over me a dozen times in my life, no? Uh, the first time was obviously uh, the Rolling Stones, when that... It's uncontrollable. It's religious, right? Um, but uh, if you are a fan, as opposed to uh, a, a money bean, maker, a bean counter, yeah. no, uh, it can affect your sistema de moon, no. And if you get on the plane the next day, and you come back to Bogota, and they don't let you in the terminal, they park you on the fucking tarmac, and you have to get into a bus. <laughs> Arriba la gripa. <laughs> <laughs> Still. No. Still, there's a part in the book where you say, which is leyendo por encima. Sí. Que, ¿Cómo me llamo en español hoy? Un poco mejor, ¿no? Un poco mejor. Sí, ok. Sí. En, 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 en el libro hay una parte de todas maneras donde usted dice que, siguiendo un poco el ejemplo de algunos artistas que ya venía oyendo en algún lugar, eh, de, de Inglaterra, usted decidió componer canciones. You wanted to write songs and make some money and stay out of school. Just get out of school as soon as you can, as you could. There's a part in the book where you say, you know, I just, I, I figured that there was a possibility I could write some songs, make some money. And oh, when I was 11 años. Right. See, okay. See, sí, sí. When I was 11. So isn't it about money too? Well, money, you have to have respect for money. There's the great old Jewish expression, you know, fuck you, fuck me once, shame on you. Fuck me twice, shame on me. Okay? So, yeah, you, you, the, you know, money is um, a balance. Um, it's very nice to have. <laughs> um, but as long as money is not your God. I would hate, um, like, to have a relationship with an artist where my passion was the money, that there was not another... It's, it's you know, it's, um, it's the shadow of where you walk. Hopefully, it's a very well-paid shadow. But you might as well work in a fucking bank or be a lawyer if you manage um, an artist and he just means, uh, you know... I mean, hey, whatever turns you on. I mean, it's, uh, for, for a lot of artists, that is all that is necessary. So, you know. Right. Um, but when I was 11, yes, I thought it was easy. Um, and I stole a song from um, an English uh, artist called Tommy Steele, and I called it Boomerang Rock, you know, based on the Australian thing that you throw in the air and it comes back. And I was very fucking surprised that nobody bought it. <laughs> Really? <laughs> well, you know. Um, but um, it was, the man was very kind with me, 
you know. Um, it didn't fuck with my head, uh, which people do today more. Um, and, uh, you know, I just carried on. And then eventually um, I started doing the work that I did. But I saw absolutely no reason when I was 11, year old, 11 right. years old why I couldn't have a hit. And there's another part in the book where you talk about how you had to deal with this very money situation to get the stones in the charts. Yeah. Uh, well, that's fig easy. Figure, figure out back in those days where the record shops that were being charted yeah. were and all that stuff. So you could. Well, it's called payola. No? Right. I mean, now they, people, they demand, what, televisions and refrigerators to play records. Back in those days, you had to pay to be on the radio, too. No, you didn't. No? No. You had um, the BBC, which played hardly any records because the Musicians' Union controlled the radio. And they wanted to make sure that um, their musicians were employed all the time. That was 50% or 60% of the radio time was live music by these terrible fucking bands, right? These old men, right? Um, and then when they played records, they played safe records. They still liked Frank Sinatra. They still liked um, Nat King Cole. Um, and so it wasn't until ooh, six, 1962, 1963 that on Saturday mornings they started having... Uh, programs in which they played some rock and roll. But it was only acceptable rock and roll. They never played Little Richard. They never played Eddie Cochran. If you wanted to hear those that type of music, you had to have a little radio with a frequency. He picked up the American, excuse me, American uh, Forces Network in Germany, right, which played a lot of black music, or Radio Luxembourg. Radio Luxembourg was a consortium that was actually owned by the record companies. And so uh, Emmy would have three hours a day. Decca would have three hours. And they would just pl put their fucking music in there and play everything that they were trying to sell. They would pay for those spaces? No, they owned the radio station. Oh, okay. okay. That, even better. Even better, <laughs> right? <laughs> of yeah. course. Right. Did you ever pay your leather stones? Yeah. Um, uh I mean, it was very easy, and, and, and it was reasonably cheap because uh, we had very loyal fans, and we didn't have any money, right? You know, but I, like a, a record then cost five shillings and sevenpence, whatever that is now, right? And you'd give them a postal order, like a money order, and some of the girls would say, no, 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 no you keep it. <laughs> and they would pay themselves, and you would put them you would, in different towns in taxis, And they would go around to two or three of the record stores on a, either a Thursday or a Saturday. You only had to buy two records, two or three records. And then on Monday, the record shop would report. To, they never bought more than three or five records anyway. Right. No? Um, he, then on Monday, they would report to the record company. We sold three of the Rolling Stones singles. So the record company would think, ah, oh, we got a fucking hit. And But then only they three. Would, then they would, exactly. Three in about 46 shops, right? Um, and that could get you to, like, number 48 in the charts. 48 out of 50. Um, we, used, we bought the first four records to about number... 20 to 30 to 38 okay and then by then it was happening by then we had um uh our base you know and uh, then finally by um let me see it would be not fade away okay uh that we helped <laughs> um but the next one little red rooster which was a blues song and what i was trying to do was i was trying to slow it down I was going, oh, no, no, man, this is getting too successful too fast. I'm getting too speedy. Um, I want to slow it down, so why don't we put out a blues record? Because a blues record, hypothetically, should not make it. No, exactly. Well, the pre-orders were 180,000, so it went straight to number one. In the UK In the only? UK. 
Yes. Big number. Which is big, right? So that was it, man, you know. It was a huge number. You know, and they all thank us for bringing the blues into the charts. But, I mean, that was, that was how big the Rolling Stones had become. Uh, you couldn't stop it. Now, I tried to hold it back with this record, but I couldn't. How long did it take to get so, that big? Okay, so I met them on April the 28th, 1963. The first record uh, come on was uh, May or June of 1963. The second single, which went just went top ten, the uh, John Lennon and Paul McCartney song, I Want to Be Your Man, that was released in November. And then the one that really started it, you, you know what an EP is, no? Yeah. An extended play is un chiquito disco con cuatro canciones. Por la precio doble de un sencillo. Okay. Um, <laughs> he... Uh, um, we put out an EP that had a cover of the Arthur Alexander song, You Better Move On. Now, Arthur Alexander was an incredible artist. Uh, the Beatles covered him with Anna and the Rolling Stones with You Better Move On. I think he had one other great song, um, Soldier Something or whatever, right? In interesting artist from New Orleans, no? Great records. Um, and Mick Jagger, the vocal, was so fucking sexy on this thing that, okay, it's it, doble la precio, no? So if a single is five shillings and seven pence, this is 11 shillings and three pennies, no? It went to number nine in the singles charts because of his performance of uh, this Arthur Alexander song. Mm hmm you can find it on YouTube. You know, if you look up, you, there's, there's videos of him. It's, it's to die for. It's incredible. You know. When did you decide to bring Lennon and McCartney in the studio? I didn't decide. Oh, that. You, you didn't do that. Well, I did. I did. No. But I mean, it, it was like one of those wonderful accidents where we had made the first single come on. I bought it into the. You know, I mean, I, it only went to number thirty-eight, and I bought most of them. You know, I mean, we may have sold, I don't know, 5,000 real copies, right? No. Um, and how many did you buy? Oh, I bought them for five weeks. So, I mean, um, I don't know, but enough, right? You know, enough to get it to number 38. So, I mean, let's, let's call it, you can know, do the math, but why bother? Let's do dreams, um, you know. Uh, and we didn't know what to record for the second record because they did not write and uh, there, there was, a, you know, a house or a, um, a reservoir of rhythm and blues songs, but they were going, going fast. I mean, you get the swinging blue jeans doing uh, hippie hippie shake, the needles, uh, the, the 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 searchers doing love potion number nine, you know, and then an awful group who were very successful called Freddie and the Dreamers. Right, who did? They, I don't know how they found it, man. But they found this great R and B song by a guy called uh, James Ray, called "If You Got to Make a Fool of Somebody." The record was great. He fucking ruined it, but it was it was a great song, and I, I and and I, that was a, a big moment for me because I went, man, you know, fucking brutus like Freddie and the Dreamers are finding these golden songs. There's not many left, and what are we going to do? Because otherwise we could become normal. Right, just another uh, act. Just another act, right? That was the danger. So uh, in this rehearsal, in this jazz club near um, Leicester Square, I always believe that if you don't know what to do, if you can't contribute, leave. No? So I went for a walk. Now, the, the, club is in a, the rehearsal club is in a basement, I come up the stairs, I could turn left, I could turn right, I turn right. And I walk to the corner, and on the corner is the Leicester Square uh, tube station. And getting out of a taxi, a little bit drunk, is John and Paul. And as they're a little bit drunk, they are a little bit psychic. <laughs> so they say to me, what's wrong, Andy? And I tell them what's wrong, I haven't got a fucking song, right? 
for, to record with the Rolling Stones. Now, John Lennon and Paul McCartney, not only were they great, uh, the great songwriters that we, we know they are, they were also great hustlers, man. Total yeah. fucking pimps. Oh, yeah. They could fucking sell anything. Okay? You put them in a room. Both? Both of them. You know, they finished each other's sentences. You know, they could sell a song to a deaf person. Okay? <laughs> right? Um, and they come down and they pretend that this song is not quite finished. And they're going to finish it in front of the stones. Right? So... They, look, it goes like this. We're not sure of the middle. We haven't quite finished it, so on and so forth. Actually, they'd recorded it 10 days ago, 10 days before, with Ringo singing. Oh, yeah? So it was already done, right? But anyway... But they were hustling. They were weighing into oh, the great. stones. They were great, man. They hustle anybody. Because in those days, your dream was to see your fucking name on a record label You're, as songwriters. I mean, my promise to Mick Jagger and Keith Richards... When they began to write, I said, if you write the songs, I promise I will get them recorded. Didn't matter whether it sold 100 copies or 50 copies or 50,000 copies. It was an accomplishment that, that you valued, no? Um, and, uh, but the, in, in that rehearsal, the moment I heard Brian Jones play um, the, uh, the bottle, the, the bottleneck guitar, steel bottleneck guitar on it, I knew we had a hit. Right. So I had my first nervous breakdown. I just couldn't handle it, man. It was just too. I heard the, the Brian Jones play this thing and I, I left the place and I went to Paris for four days. You went and hung out. over. Just hung out, sat around, walked around the shops. I actually bought a great pair of boots. Um, but, um, you know, I mean, it was overwhelming because sometimes, you know, we, remember how young we are and you're hearing the future like. And Brian Jones um, uh, was not very pleasant to be with, except when he was playing, right? And his playing, if you listen, and maybe you'll have the opportunity to uh, play, if you play some of the Beatles record of, with Ringo singing, I Want to Be Your Man, and then you play the Rolling Stones thing, you'll see you know, the, the, the total difference. And you'll hear, uh, I mean, Brian Jones is basically that record, his playing. Why was it nice to hang out with? Well, he, he's kind of, yeah, I mean, people said to me recently, you and Keith Richards, you keep saying what a cunt Brian Jones was. Well, he was, you know. I mean, he was like a split personality. Um, he was like a cat who had um, had nine lives, and somebody made a mistake and sent him back for another one. You're not meant to have ten lives, right? <laughs> So he, he makes this, uh, he was a split personality. He, he, he thought he was a blues purist. Um, he, then he wanted the fame. He wanted the Beatle thing. He wanted all that as well. And so he was a very conflicted person. Um, he, there was not a drug that he would not take or a girl he would not have a, a baby with. There's so many fucking Brian Joneses all over the place. You know, it's amazing. Um, and uh, he... Also, he's a part of one thing. If you look at all of the people who died uh, at the age of 27, I mean, you've got a lot of them, man. Jim, you know, Janice, oh, Cobain. Yeah. Right? There's actually a phenomenon called Saturn Return. Right? And it deals with... Um, the four cycles of life, and basically what happens to these people like Brian Jones, Jimi Hendrix, Kurt Cobain, and everything else, is that, <coughs> excuse me, that they arrive at this time and they're worn out. They don't have the energy to sign on for the next chapter. Right. And the next chapter in Saturn Return takes you up to roughly the age of like 56, 58, which is ironically where both George Harrison and Steve Jobs died. Died. I mean, you know, whatever happened, George Harrison had enough of the cancer, the other one had enough of the cancer. They haven't got the, the reservoir... To continue. Uh, to, to continue to the next one, which takes us till we're 84, if we're lucky. <laughs> okay. 
That'll be the third. That's the third. And the fourth. And there's a fourth of when you're about 114. <laughs> okay. Okay. So. Okay. That's. You know. Wow. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, you look it up. You know, it's and that really. Then you go. Well, that explains that. <laughs> you know. Um, and he, um, Brian, was one of those uh, people. When did you decide to say, um, manager, no longer? Yeah, I'm no longer with the Stones. What did you decide to quit? Well, you see, very rarely in life do we actually make our own decisions. If we're lucky enough to recognize uh, what you call the writing on the wall, then we go, okay, right? People are trying to kill me here. It's time to leave, <laughs> right? Okay. Um, uh, f basically, from the moment that I got a guy called Alan Klein to become the business manager of the Rolling Stones. It was the beginning of my end. But you started working as partners? No, he was the business manager of me and the Rolling Stones. But um, uh, Alan Klein is a very unique animal uh, who has ended up owning most of the copyrights of the people he represented. I including mean, the Stones? Include, he owns, he, his companies own, he's dead now, um, own everything from like 1963 to 1971. He has a piece of the Beatles uh, from 1969 to 1971. He has a piece of the Who. He has a piece of the Kinks. He has all of Sam Cooke. Wow. Um, okay. Uh, the man is totally unique and... Even though he fucked us, uh, which it says so in the book, right? That's fine, you know, because in this business, you know, if he, like when I was 11 and I didn't have the, they didn't like my song, you've got to be able to get up and keep moving, right? But um, the man, the, as the man took over the business and as the Stones' uh, requirements became money, um, what I did became less necessary. They were also fed up. They'd worked for five years nonstop. They wanted a rest. They wanted to go off and, and kind of have some kind of a life. They didn't want to have to keep making singles. Uh, all I knew how was to make singles, right? Um, and, uh, but you see, because the irony is if I had not got Alan Klein to come in and represent us all. I could easily have lost the Rolling Stones in 1965 because we were having problems with another manager and we were in the high courts and it was fucking money and this and crooks and... Why? Well, I had a partner in the beginning. Right. Because uh, I talk good. Knock on you still do. See? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but I needed someone to get them work. So I got this agent who hated them, man. He fucking hated them because he was a failed organ player who'd had to become an agent. Oh, Andrew, you're spending much too much time with Mick and Keith. You shouldn't socialize with the artists. It's bad for business, you know. Um, and then eventually, by 1965, none of us were talking. Um, and he wanted to fuck us big with the record company. He wanted to do a deal that gave him money, not us money, and he was going to sign. And I'm not a businessman. So I really didn't know what I was going to do about this. And the Rolling Stones are looking at me. Well, some of them liked this guy. Two of them liked this guy. Brian, of course, and Bill, and Mick and Keith were with me. And Charlie was just sitting in the middle, right? And um, fortunately, then I met Alan Klein, and he took care of it. But there's a cost. Lucifer, you know, I mean, you know, you... Sooner or later. So, yeah. You know. You end up paying the price. You end up, yeah. You know. um, but you were smart enough, now that you were talking about Alan Klein and the Masters, you, you were smart enough to tell the Stones to keep their ma Masters. That was your idea as well. Yes. Well, that's so because it was, I studied. It's, fun, it's funny because you kind of became a victim of your own invention, right? I mean, yeah. you told the Stones, hey, keep your masters, and then Alan Klein moved on and No, did well, the we same kept thing. our masters. If we, would, if we didn't, hadn't produced our own records, 
there would have been nothing for Alan Klein to steal because we would have been like an artist who is signed to the record company. Right? But, you know, I didn't necessarily do that in the beginning for financial reasons. I did it for reasons of freedom in that um, the, the whole idea of being a slave to a record company... And, you know, remember in those days, recording sessions were three hours. And they expected you to record three or four songs um, in those three hours. And basically until, and Sgt. Pepper, that's the way the record business went. And then the Beatles, as they did with everything, continued to break all the rules. And suddenly the Beatles are in all night. <laughs> you know, and then we'd be recording in California and we were in all night. Um, You'd be doing pet sounds with the Beach Boys? Pardon? Pet Sounds with the Beach Boys. That's another one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Another, another one that broke. Um, you were a part of that, no, weren't you? No, not really. No, no, I wasn't. I was a huge admirer of it. And I took out an advertisement to tell everybody in England to buy it. Um, um, uh, and uh, But we we're all part of the same movement of freedom. I mean, so the, the reason that I wanted to own the Masters was mainly because so nobody I could so I could say to the record company this is the single I didn't have to have somebody tell me what they thought the single was I mean the Rolling Stones and I decided what was on the records what the artwork was what it looked like because to me uh the look defines the sound or it should the look should be an example of the sound you look at it and you basically even if it's subliminal you know what you're going to hear Right, um, and uh, the the record industry at that time worked nine to five. They were not experts. They didn't fucking care. They would go Just home. like now. There you go. Right? <laughs> well, everything you know will it go around in circles? Well, you it's a, it's funny because it does sound like that, you know. Oh but no, no, there are many. Men, you're completely correct. There are an amazing amount of parallels now where, for different reasons, the record companies don't know what the fuck they're doing. So what they do is to keep the buildings open. They just don't pay the old acts. You know, the amount of lawsuits going on, the Temptations just sued Universal. Uh, Bruce Springsteen and a number of Just sued of the, Sony, right? Is huh? he going to sue Sony? They, they, it's all, you know, Pink Floyd won against EMI. You know, record companies have always, have always done one thing. They steal. Uh, this is, the music business is an incredible business where if you look at the two things that make, well, the road is king in the road, right? But if you look at the two things inside the business, like the recording part and the publishing part, you've got, you're dealing in a world where when you are introduced to a p music publisher or a record company, they're all smiles. Ay, tu es talentoso. Tu es increíble. Bienvenido. Es un privilegio que tu trabajo aquí. And in the back, they've got accountants working out how to fuck you already. That hasn't changed. No, there, no. There's a part in the book where you say that record companies fall in love with you twice. Yeah. Once, when they discover you, and twice, when you start selling I should say three times and three when they fuck you. Right? you know, um, um, That's a good analogy. Yeah, you know, uh, but nothing that we're discussing should stop anybody, if music is their life, from going into music. It's still the best game in town. You know, it's still the most... I mean, if you can be a part of it, it's still... Uh, the most, uh, you know, it's better than a real job. No, though, mind you, these days it is a real job because it does involve, um, I mean, 10% is the creation of the work and 90% is the promotion, the this, the that. And that requires a discipline um, because the hardest thing for artists to, it, today is to be able to play. I, I presume it's the same here in Colombia as the rest of the world, but basically a young act has to pay to play that's it that's the way it goes yeah. well how are you ever gonna get to a point the whole idea is that you're as good in a room with three people as you are with three thousand people and that it takes time and the, the tragedy is is people don't get the time 
I mean, for example, you remember the group Franz Ferdinand? Yeah, sure. I'm glad somebody does. <laughs> um, but he's very bright, the boy Alex, no? And he said, um, he said, hey, I'll never have to make a greatest hits record. It's our first record. Because you've got to fucking vomit up, deliver everything with the first record, or the booking agencies, the record companies, the magazines, the whole circus is not... There's no growth by increments, no? Right. There's no development. Exactly. Yeah. You know, you've got to be stupid from minute one. <laughs> yeah. But there yeah. are still people who say that maybe the reason why this development is not taking place with new musicians happens because the big musicians hold control of all the business. And here we, we could talk about Bruce Springsteen easily, who is one of the major yeah. concert sellers in the world. And yeah. you too, that, uh, is it like, what, number two? In the list of worldwide biggest selling arena and stadium? And Taylor Swift. Yeah. Okay, and Taylor <laughs> Swift. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, th then that would be like the 10% of the yeah, musicians. So well, there's no space for the young is. kids, is there? there? Is. Yeah. I mean, look, when the Rolling Stones were I mean, playing... they're keeping all the money. Mm. Okay, you do have a problem today because of the lack of jobs, the fact that for 35 years the day of the white man is finished, okay? Uh, disposable income is getting less. Um, it... Is hard, also, it's harder for an artist to establish themselves because, say, 20 years ago, if you had the ability, say, in England, to play the Royal Festival Hall or the Teatro Jose Gatin, <laughs> no? um, even if people didn't go to see you, they knew you were in town. Right? Okay. Um, Now I can look at uh, something that is appearing in uh, either Jose Gatan or the Royal Festival Hall. And I've, it's, it's the truth. I don't know who the fucking artist is. I've never... It's a, it's a girl. I can't remember her name. But I've never heard of her. I've never heard her fucking music. Because everything is niche. No? You can be big, or reasonably big, um, amongst a certain amount of people, and it doesn't have the effect anymore where it's universal it's not you know there's there's people working you know uh, uh, there's there's people working all over the world and unless you like them they do very well man i mean god there's this artist from uh, miami uh oh he's an old cuban well, he's not old uh raul uh you know he's got a great voice his voice sounds like roy orbison no I wish I could remember his name, okay? But he really, he's, he's got a great voice, right? Is he known? Yeah. yeah okay. Raul is some something. Rings you know, a bell, but I Cano, Cano, like Raul. Um, sorry, Raul, <laughs> okay? But he goes to England and he fills the Albert Hall. That's 7,000 people. But so what? Right? I mean, it's a very strange, or an Italian artist like Zucchero. He comes in and he can fill the Albert Hall, you know, because Italians are everywhere, <laughs> you know, uh, waiters. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. He, and um, so it's it's no, I, I disagree with you. I mean, in terms of they take away. OK, when the Rolling Stones were playing clubs, artists like Frank Sinatra, big bands like Gil Evans, Little Richard, uh, the Everly Brothers were coming in and filling the theaters, they were the stars. But it did, still didn't stop people growing. You know, artists were able to grow. Probably the last artists who, who I think, apart from things like Fish, Fish or whatever they are, right? Uh, is, fish from New York. Yeah. Yeah. Like, is probably the police. They're the last ones who got into a truck, who got into a van, and they fucking toured America until they were getting radio play, until they were doing this. You know, I think they were in, a, they were in a, an old Volkswagen van for like two years. Just place, place, you know. And uh, it's, it's very difficult now because an artist can go on the road, but where, what's the situation of radio? Radios um, still is very old-fashioned.
as it was before. Exactly. I mean, nothing's really changed. That's no. amazing. Yeah. You know, it seems like you set to, to move in cycles. Oh, and, which makes it easier in, in some ways. Because hey, look, there's, there's always one golden rule. A hit record is three things. A hit song, a hit song, and a hit song. Doesn't matter what you do to it, man. Doesn't matter whether you put reggae to it. Doesn't matter whether you put beats to it. It doesn't matter whether you put a New Orleans sound to it. If it's a hit song, it's a hit song. The only main difference is about 20 years ago, Quincy Jones said, you can't shine shit. Well, you can. <laughs> you know, now uh, the, the top end of the pop market is so auto-tuned. Um, and so um, fakely dramatic. I mean, they have to, these poor kids, they have to give everything they've got the first time. There's no, you know, I mean, There's look. No second chance. Yes, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, these, all the, these uh, talent shows, I mean, they're behave, they have to behave as artists that in the old days, three years later, they would have a chance how to. L all right, working a television camera is one thing. Either the camera loves you or it doesn't, okay? But working a room is a totally different beast, you know. And none of these kids know how to work a room or work Why? people. Why not? Because they don't, they don't have, they, they, they no don't have the mileage. They don't have the mileage. They didn't put the time in. I mean, let us remember one thing, that when the first Beatles single was released in October of 1962. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let us say that, hypothetically, the Beatles played 1,000 shows in their life. By October, the first week of October 1962, they had already played 500 of them. Wow. They put, you know, right? Hamburg, That's all the toilets. Load of okay? You know, Hamburg, Glasgow, Liverpool, Manchester, uh... Bremen, no? Um, that's, I mean, the Rolling Stones, uh-uh. Um, they'd probably played, not, you know, nowhere near. That's half, the Beatles have done half of their performing life before the first single. Uh, the Rolling Stones, 3%, 5%. Um, I mean, Keith Richards says that, that going to university was going on tour. With, uh, which we did in November, October and November of 1963 with the Everly Brothers and Bo Diddley, no? And Little Richard, right? That was school. That was university, right? To see these fucking Americans every night, you know? Um, and uh, because it's an American art. You know, it's as simple as that. And so there you go, man. I mean, look, now everybody's living in their room with their fucking laptops, you know? I am great. Recording on Pro Tools. Max took me, to, wanted me to hear a friend of his about five years ago in Los Angeles. No, I said okay. Guy plays a song. It's thirteen minutes long. Uh, it was awful too. Right, <laughs> we're sitting in a car in in Hollywood. Right, listening to this shit, and uh, I said to the guy, "Have you ever thought of making the songs uh, shorter?" <laughs> <laughs> and he says, no, 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 no one's touching my music. I said, well, no one's going to hear it either. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, it's, it's, everybody is a star. You got, whereas, and it's not their fault. It's because, you know, in the Facebook, Facebook, this, so, so, and so, so, and so, everybody is a star. What Andy Warhol said about the 15 minutes of fame he didn't realize how right he was and that it would it would be a disease that would spread to... I mean, look at people walking down the street on the telephone. They're fucking superstars. Yeah, see me, see me more, see Gorda. You know, I mean, God bless them, right? <laughs> but, they, they, but if it's somebody who writes songs or does something, they very rarely have the opportunity to sit and play and fail. Because these days, if some young artist plays a club, the club owner says, well, you've got to guarantee you're going to sell 100 tickets or whatever. So they invite 100 of their friends. So they're not going to fail. Their friends are going to fucking love them. 
It's all wrong. True. Okay. Um, the Stones did university with the Americans. Yeah. Uh, watching them perform, uh -huh. Bo Diddley and all these big kahunas. And now it seems that the only thing we've been talking about 25 minutes, but we've been talking about 25 minutes about the fact that things change to kind of stay the same. But one thing I find is different, and it's that the Stones were doing their university looking at these American musicians perform. And nowadays it seems as though the British mastered pop in such a way that everything is coming out of Great Britain when it comes to uh, Earth, popular earthquakes, say for example Adele, or oh, she's terrible. But she's, she's a huge. fucking chocolate box. Yeah, but you know, I mean, but she's huge. She is huge, but there's a freak every year, man. You know, it was Susan Boyle two, three years ago. Um, I can't stand Adele. But she's becoming a big selling artist. Like, I mean, she'll she's up disappear, there. man. She'll do her 16, 20 million records. You cannot get away with having a great voice, which she does. And then her whole act is, oh, I'm so I'm so nervous. I'm thinking, you know, oh, am I in show business? You know, or that, you know, have, you know, it won't last. You know, you have to be able to take her voice takes command. But for an artist or an actor, the aura And, you know, the whole presence, like Bruce, has to take command. An audience wants you to take command of them. They will only put up for so long with weakness. Strong voice, weak person. Uh, she has no fucking stage presence at all. She looks like a maid for the royal family. You know, um, she's disastrous looking. Um, <laughs> Uh, and she's today's box of chocolates. She's very sweet, and everybody wants to taste her, and God bless her, and there, it's always been like that, you know. And the record company, for you know, will think, oh, we still know what we're doing. The record company, we still, you know. The radio still thinks that, they that. Know what, that, that. we know yeah. what we're doing when we're yeah. playing her as well. Right. That's yeah. interesting, but still, the British... Are dominant. No, yeah, they are, but it's so boring, man, to start with. I wish they'd learned to fucking speak English. You know, they insist... How can you go universal? Like, okay, the Arctic Monkeys. The dialect is not universal. They sing in their local dialect, and that is limiting. Gets you, gets you, you know, it gets you that first audience. And the first audience is always... Um, People who want to have discovered you first, not share you with anybody, and then when you become really big, they go, no, I don't like them anymore. They sold out, right? Well, the Arctic Monkeys will never have the opportunity to sell out. I, I, I saw them on the television the other night. You know something? Their songs are so derivative of other songs. Of course. That I can't even be bothered to try and guess what they're stealing it from. Um, not many of these people have compelling lead voices. You know, they don't have compelling uh, lead singers. They have compelling energy, for, sh for sure. You know, yes, you're right. The English come over to South by Southwest. It doesn't matter whether it's, what was that uh, three-piece band? Two twins, uh, Johnny Marr was playing with them. Um, mm. Tremendous energy, right. you know? I mean, yes, the English have, have, have always had and the Scottish, and the Welsh, uh, always had, you know, tremendous um, energy, right? Um, Americans, mm, you know, unless they're being American, then it works. When they're trying to be anything else, it's a fucking... It's, it's a parody. It's a parody, yeah. right, yeah. you know, like, you know, the suffering people, you know, all that crap, you know. But... Is there anything that moves you nowadays? Is there a front man that you say, maybe this could work? Maybe this could last? Because the monkeys don't... You can't don't, tell, man. You the, really the monkeys can't don't tell. work for you. Adele doesn't work for you. And, well, and I didn't say I can't. I, you know, um, I understand the weakness part about it. Yeah. Though. Well, I see, unfortunately, that's, my, um, that's why it's easier for me to watch films because I know less about films than I do about music. So, you know, my judgment 
um, right. thing is 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 in a different thing. Uh, I wa- okay, like I was watching the other night, um, uh, Jules Holland, no, right, right, and you know, yeah, it's still the old question: Can they go the distance? Or, um, look, to start with, as, as we've disagreed, the song is the key. You, you arrive at your first record. You probably shouldn't be making a whole CD anyway. Sure. Yeah, what, what fucking life experience have you had? You know, there's going to be two songs and ten passengers. Now, that's a fucking insult anyway, but that's the machine that runs the world of the music, apart from where, where we're going with downloads. You've still got to have an album. And downloads. If you want to play the general game with the record companies, okay? Um, mind you, man, Esther and I went to a concert in New York in about 1984 in uh, Lincoln Center, uh, we wanted a night out, and there was a band of uh, from Peru, just fucking flutes and so and so and so and so, right? Flutes and shit and all this, and very nice, right? When we left the concert, they were selling their own CDs, okay? And I remember that very clearly. And then, in the say, you know, as a, as the sign of the future, an artist makes more money. Uh, selling his CDs and selling the T-shirts than they do from the gig. No? Uh, in 1983, I had the opportunity to work with Ozzy Osbourne. I was supposed to write a um, screenplay for him. He was, you know... I mean, you haven't lived until you've been on the road with Ozzy. This is 1983 with Randy Rhodes. Wow. <laughs> okay, about six months before Randy Rhodes died wow. right, in that plane crash. Yeah. And... Uh, one of the most, or one of the psychedelic experiences I've had, not necessarily with drugs, is arriving in a town like Chicago or Albany, and the Grateful Dead people are leaving the hotel and the grounds and the town because the Grateful Dead were playing the night before, and the Ozzy Osbourne people at midday and one o'clock are arriving and taking over the same space. Okay? It's fucking surreal, right? But anyway, back then, in 1983, Epic Records, CBS, hated fucking Aussie. Why did they sign him? Hey. They hated him. He was signed to them, okay? Somebody, somebody walked into a room with a good mouth, okay? Because that's what it took, okay? How did Bruce Springsteen get signed? Because he had a guy with a good mouth who went and said, I promise you, this is God, basically. It was a guy called Mike Appel. He was the first manager, right? He was a believer, right? Um, and it, it, this Ozzy Osbourne, the money they were making in merch, in the merchandising in 1983, was incredible. Like they T-shirts and hats. Yeah, and They didn't need the fucking record company. It didn't matter that the record company said, oh, God, the Ozzy Osbourne, please, he's embarrassing. Right? They were... You know, I mean, it was Sharon Osborne, no, um, and he, he was already a force to be Reckon reckoned with. with. You know, uh, and this is 1983, right? And um, does a manager have to have that? I mean, does he have to be a believer to get to where Springsteen is, where the Stones are at now? It, see, it all depends on the artist, okay. Uh, I am. T- I was told the other day that the uh, manager of one is, when he began with him, said, "I didn't care about the fucking music. I didn't understand the music. Right. I really didn't care." He didn't. Uh, I knew I could just make money. Well, I understand that because I saw him in uh, uh, in the Hyatt Hotel in Buenos Aires in 1994 with Enrique Iglesias, and I'm quite sure he felt the same fucking way about Enrique Iglesias as he did about one is. Okay, doesn't matter. Because in those cases, both Juanes and Enrique Iglesias have enough faith in themselves that they only need a fucking bean counter, a money collector. Uh, you know, I have no doubt that those two gentlemen wake up in the morning and they go and put water on their faces and go, God, I'm great. 
Okay? So they don't need a fucking manager telling them they're great. Some artists do. You know, it, it's, it's, it's like a marriage. Okay? The balance, the percentages of the relationship, the support or, or not support or... You know, those kind of artists, if a manager had an opinion, they'd kill him. Right? Uh, and they don't need it for, um, uh, supposedly. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, and then other artists work better um, under the structure of a team and, a, a, like, in a boxing ring with a man, you know. I mean, one of the greatest conspiracies that I ever saw was in 1962, and that's Bob Dylan, at, excuse me, and his manager, Albert Grossman. These people, this was a conspiracy, man. And I did the publicity for uh, Bob Dylan for 10 days in England in 1963, the beginning of 1963. How did and they conspire? I mean... It's very strange, man. You've got to remember, okay, I'm 19. I get the job. I get five pounds or something like that, right? And I'm in the room. I'm only in the room with them for 20 minutes. And it changed the rest of my life because I hadn't, I would, I met the Rolling Stones two months later, right? I was still just doing publicity. And whatever this fucking thing was, they were like an old married couple. <laughs> you know, they just fucking excluded the rest of the world. Uh, they, they were, but the, there was only one subject, Bob Dylan. <laughs> that was all they, they spoke about. doesn't matter if they're pretending to speak about something else. The subject is Bob. We are here to serve Bob. Simple as that, right? Um, and I looked at these two people sitting there like, you know, they're like an old Jewish couple, you know? Um, <laughs> right? Um, and I went, whatever this is, I want it. This, this is, you know, this is the kind of relationship I would love to be able to have uh, with somebody. And then there are no accidents. And two months later, I met the Rolling Stones. Wow. Wow. Okay. So be careful what you ask for. <laughs> you might get it. <laughs> you know. Now, when you talk about marriage, um, how do you stay married in this business? <laughs> you say that marriage, that the relationship in, between a manager and... Uh, Are you musician. talking about that kind of marriage or actual I'm, marriage? I am talking about the, the comparison okay. and how someone in the business would be able to deal with both things at the same time and be successful at both things. Yeah. How, how can you be a family person and be successful at that? And how can you be married to a musician and be successful at that as well? Can you have both of them well, or you can say, you can, not? It just depends on the chemistry of... You, you've got to go act by act, okay? Now, uh, uh, Paul McGuinness with U2, U2, he has 25% of the act, right? Um, they basically come from the same uh, mm. Catholic background in whatever part of Ireland they come from. So they, have, they grew up with the same sensibility. He protects them. They all, U2... Uh, part of their image, I'm not saying it's not true, but part of their image is that they're good Catholics, they're married, they have families, and so therefore, for the manager to be able to have a family within that structure, it works. If you're with Lenny Kravitz, <laughs> I'm sure it might be different, right? You know, because his requirements, or Michael Jackson, you know, you know, whatever, right? So... And then if you look at the Bruce Springsteen structure, you know, for the, for the, since 1975 or 1977, he's had John Landau, who was the journalist at Rolling Stone, who first said, I have seen the future, and it's Bruce Springsteen. And John Landau manages with a lady called Barbara Carr, who's actually married to that journalist, Dave Marsh, to have this great relationship with him where... They see it worked, man. I mean, come on. Uh, uh, where they do the work and they go home, right? Whereas um, the Rolling Stones must, must be slightly different. They all have their own managers. Um, they haven't recorded in the same room for 25 years. 
Uh, Mick and Keith haven't spoken to each other except on stage for 20 years. They arrive. You should go backstage, man. I mean, um, nobody, they don't, they don't see each other. There's nothing personal about it anymore. No, and they just go on stage, and even the smiles are automatic, you know. And it, if that's totally acceptable to the public, you know. I mean, it has to be professional, you know. Um, and then uh, I have another friend who's an, uh, there's an artist called Steve Earle, who's very political. Um, he's an American artist. He's very good. Um, and his manager, who used to run Mercury Records, is also very political. He did no nukes with Jackson Brown and things like that. So that is the the uh, the bed, so to speak, of their relationship, of how this manager and artist works. They have the same politics. So you never know what it's going to be, or else it can be just fucking leave me alone, collect the money, I'm fucking brilliant. Yeah. You know, it really de- it it really depends on the act. On, you know, finding the right combination, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. How long have you been doing radio with uh, Stephen Van Zandt? Five, five years. years? Yeah. You happy? Hey, I love it, man. I mean, uh, um, my mother would have loved it because I have a regular job. Um, and uh, if I ever meet a disc jockey who goes to therapy, I'd fucking shoot him. <laughs> because, you know, I mean, it is fucking therapy just doing it, right? You... I mean, I'm allowed to say whatever I like, Um um, they edit me if I attack Elton John too much. Oh, yeah? Um, so, you know, if I get too, you know. Um, I think I said something about, you know, if the gays aren't careful, they'll be the next Nazis. But, um, you know, um, get back in the fucking closet and stop boring me. No. Um, and uh, I'm allowed to do what I like. Um, I'm on every day. Uh, it's a wonderful way. I mean, I... And I You know, I was just like, I spent three weeks driving around America, right? And then I go and do the programs. And uh, I had somebody write into me the other day, said, you went to Westport in Connecticut and you went to this old record shop um, that I used to go to. And there's a a woman who owns a record shop that I've known for 40 years now. And he said, I went all uh, technically, you know, I, I transferred all my stuff and I don't buy records. I'm now going to go back and see that woman, right? And they kind of like thank me for the relationship that I have with America. And so it's very, very rewarding. Right. And the music's great. That's three hours of, uh, every three hours week. A day and, all and four a hours day. on the weekend. Four, four hours on the weekend. Yeah. That's uh, how many songs? Huh? How many songs are you playing per hour? Uh, 11, about 10 times 5. Okay, so that's 50 in the week and 13 times 5 at the weekend. Do you work on a playlist before? No, thank God. <laughs> you don't? The computer just... fucking spits it out, okay? <laughs> you know, couldn't fucking do it. Can you imagine if I was depressed one week? That'd be like, awful. Yeah, we're going to play, we're going to listen to Leonard Cohen for three hours. You know. <laughs> yeah. That would be god awful. Right. You know? <laughs> I know. So no, it's Stephen's taste, Stephen's uh, uh, music, and fortunately, his life pivots around one date, the date in February when the Beatles played the Ed Sullivan Show, and so all the music that we play is the music that influenced everything going in, the blues, Little Richard, Fats Domino, and then everything that came after, the Clash, the Sex Pistols, the Rolling Stones, the Kinks, and 13th Floor Elevators, what, you know, Brian Setts, or whatever the music is, right? Um, and, of course, we still play Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, were you happy with the translation? How, how, how did this How do whole... I know, man? You, you have no, no idea. No, I, mean, you know, I mean, you know what I mean? I mean? How long did it take to translate the book? I went through three translators, and okay. I used friends in Argentina, and I used my son to check it and check it. The first guy was a fucking pedestrian. He's the guy who's got the credit in the book. Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> how come he's know, got the credit in the book? Well, because that's, do it? you know, the, 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 the field of arts have strange laws. And so the first person who worked on it gets the credit. Wow. It's quite like screenplays. You know, I had a friend in Uruguay work on it. Uh, and so I, you know, I know enough to be able to, you know, I say, hey, listen, you know, my instinct's good. I say, I say Max, or I say to my friend Rafael in, in Uruguay, not sure about this. No, 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 it sucks. Like, um, so 
But hey, the res- I, I, the, the results so far, it, it's not stiff. The whole idea is that it has uh, the rhythm of the music. Because when I'm writing a book, to me, it's like making a record. I make the tracks. I do the overdub. I do the lead guitar. I do the lead vocal. I mix it. I master it. Uh, and hopefully, the whole idea is, like music, that it swings. I mean, some of the, the great books that I like, were like uh, there's a book by Chet Baker, or the Miles Davis books, or um, uh, that, you know, they reflect, they have that pendulum, they have that, that you have that swing, that you have the rhythm, the nuance, and the language of the time. So if we've partially or nearly totally succeeded... And I've, it's interesting that I've done it through Buenos Aires because the translations were done down there. Right. Because Buenos Aires is one of the only two countries in South America that understands rock and roll music to start with. Um, so that helps, right? And the other thing is that it, w- it was wise to send it to Argentina because it would have been awful if you had a Spanish from Spain translated. Now, that would have been awful. I think so. I agree with you, man. That would have been really awful. The biggest mistake that, that, peop- that, that I can make, or other, when we say if I, I come from Europe and I come to live here, is the fact, you know, somewhere near England is Spain. Right. We used to go there on holidays, right? Right. You still uh, do. Huh? You still do. They British still go fucking gangsters. For the, you know, for the summer. Yeah. They moved to Ibiza. They want to go where there's no Indians, no? <laughs> right. Um, and they uh, they... But the, the, what I'm, say, I'm saying is that subliminally you can arrive in South America and because you speak Spanish, we can get you confused with the Spanish. It's not the same fucking... It's nothing, thank God. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Colombians here who copy the Spanish, you can see them down at the Plaza de Toros. No? No, please. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not the real blood, right? I mean, this... I will never... One of the privileges of living here is I will never completely get it. I will always be learning. There will always be new lessons, new things every day, uh, because, you know, if I think it's here, and here Andrew's holding his hands in front of him, it's here, or it's there. Uh, um, it's an inc- the, 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 This continent and Colombia is an incredible mosaic. You, you just uh, and, and it's rich and it's deep and it's superficial and it's stupid and it's Amparo and it's total all those things, right? And it's uh, God bless her pills and uh, you, know, um, you know, yeah. Oh, please. Um, anyway, peel grapes. It's easier. Um, but you know, and I don't st- every day. Never get bored here, baby. You know, I mean, it, this country is my heartbeat. Awesome. I'd look a lot older if I lived in England, I'll tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for dropping by, for translating the book for us. We're, we're sure going to enjoy it. It's, Thank you. It's going to be very successful. La Feria del Libro. Next week, martes, si, right? No? Si. Tuesday. Yeah. It's going to be the release. We're going to be working on this interview make a big special out of it i appreciate that it's amazing 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 to have you here it's an honor thank you very much man thank you okay that's it esa es la conversación con andrew lou goldham that was the conversation with mr andrew lou goldham i hope you enjoyed this show of uh the alejandro marin bilingual podcast show espérelo muy pronto la semana que viene aquí en algún lugar de la web chao